Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired operating systems engineer from Microsoft, going all the way back to the Windows 95 and MS-DOS days, and I'm going to tell you the secret history of Microsoft Gary. Gary was a dude down the hall from me who likely did more than any human being since Gutenberg to democratize access to the printing press. I also want to make you aware of an upcoming live stream on Sunday night and to get your suggestions for an upcoming interview. All that and more, this time in Dave's Garage. Now, before we talk about Gary, I want to let you know that I'm planning to do a Windows War Stories live stream and I'd like to encourage you to join me. It's my first one ever and I'd be sad if nobody turned up, so do me a solid and stop on by. We'll be getting together at 7 p.m. PST this Sunday night, which is 10 p.m. Eastern on the 24th of January, right here on the Dave's Garage channel. I'll be available for your questions and I'd like to pick your brains for ideas on upcoming episodes for the series. I'm also excited to announce that I'll be having a special guest on an upcoming episode, a former Vice President of Human Resources at Microsoft. To that end, I'd like to find out what questions you might have about interviewing, hiring, firing, stock options, reviews, and anything really related to HR at all. Please leave me a comment on this video with your suggestions, and of course, there's no better way to get your question heard than to stop by the live stream on Sunday night. And now I want to talk about a guy named Gary down the hall from me. Gary started a while after me, in 1997, I think. I believe we were in building 25 or 26 at the time, and I'd heard that Gary was an expert in something to do with color science and had a bunch of patents, but a lot of people around me were experts at one thing or another, and the NT team was so full of industry veterans that almost everybody seemed to have about a dozen patents. Heck, even I've got half a dozen. But for most people, if you're lucky to get exposed to even a few experts now and then during your life, you're doing pretty good. I was lucky enough to be surrounded by a ton of them. I mean, three doors in the other direction was Raymond Chen, and that's like saying Google lived three doors down from you, because either way, you can ask them pretty much anything and they'll know the answer. In multiple languages, even. In fact, they seem to know the answer with such ease that it's easy for it to become a reflex to just ask them before even really thinking very hard. And while Google is eager to show you multiple ad impressions, Raymond doesn't suffer fools quite as gladly. But expert means different things to different people. On the one hand, you have a lot of self-described experts in the world, people eager to tell you why they're outstanding in their own fields, some even oozing expertise and sincerity for the highest bidder as expert witnesses in almost any field you can imagine. At the other end of the spectrum are people that truly are the quiet experts in their important fields, but who so lack the gene for self-promotion that their contributions can almost go unheralded or even unknown. I don't know if I had a reputation for this around the halls of Microsoft, but even if not, I certainly deserved one as a bit of a time burglar. Well, this has been terrific. Let's do it again sometime. Are you standing up to get me to leave? By that, I mean I tended to work heads down for hours at a time without talking to anyone, and then I wanted five or ten minutes of social interaction, which I would get by wandering by your office and telling you my favorite and most relevant anecdotes. Hey, I'm not a time burglar. Probably my favorite victim for this was a guy named John Barry. About three times a week I'd wander into his office to chat and flip through his magazines, no doubt getting my donut crumbs all over his copy of Microprocessor Report. I'd sit for a minute and I'd tell him my random theories and musings on the new Simpsons episode before heading back to my office to get some actual work done. John was also my boss at the time, so I don't know how smart it was to waste his time like that, but then he knew that I knew that he only subscribed to Microprocessor Report for the respect, so we had an understanding. With some people though, I know when to shut up and just listen. Like, I have an old friend Jim, a 70-year-old curmudgeonly Vietnam combat veteran who still runs his own automotive repair and custom fabrication shop near my home. Going to his shop, which I do at least a couple times a week, is a little like visiting the barber shop in the movie Gran Torino. Except there's a lot more profanity and smoking, and the Playboy centerfolds are hung proudly on the walls rather than hidden away in the magazines. Jim knows all there is to know about repair and welding and the fabrication of classic and race cars. And I'm the kind of guy where if you know a lot about a topic, and if I know that you're a rare resource about a topic, and I'm seriously interested in that topic, as I am with cars, then I will pepper you with questions about the topic whenever we're together until I'm sure that you've told me all there is to know about the topic, or until it becomes obvious that it's time to stop, or worst case, until you will just no longer talk to me any further. The other guy that's always been around the shop has been Rick, and I don't actually have a picture of Rick, but thanks to a little prosopic nausea, to me, he looks exactly like Wilford Brimley, so you might as well just go ahead and picture him as Wilford Brimley. I know I do. Except working on an engine dyno. That's because Rick used to be a Winston Cup engine builder for a famous NASCAR racing team down south before he retired up to my area to putter on the engine dyno at Jim's shop and build engines in the back room. Now, between Jim and Rick, they've got three good eyes, one good pancreas, and more types of different cancers than any ten men should really have. And while Jim is well and still plugs away all day in the shop, between cancer and COVID, I haven't seen that much of Rick in a long time. 
The 427 big block he hand built for my 2 plus 2 that I'm restoring may well have been among his last, but one of my highlights was dyno tuning the motor with my brother, Rick, Jim, and a guy named Larry Webb. Larry looks like and has the swagger of an old Paul Newman, but he's really there because he spent about 60 years at General Motors working on carbs and fuel injection, and for all I know, he literally probably worked on the design of the Rochester Quadrajet carburetor that my motor originally came with back then, and Jim just happens to know him. Pretty handy for me. It'd be something like having Eric Clapton stop by to tune your guitar. When he couldn't find a factory metering rod that was within a thousandth of an inch of what he felt he needed, he turned his own on Jim's lathe right then and there. If you're not sure what that means, just know that any sufficiently manly task is akin to magic, and it was pretty magical to watch. In the end, there are two things you can be sure of that day. That motor ran balls out in the dyno and dead nuts to the spec, and I asked that Larry guy a ton of questions about carburetors in the little time that I had with him. I joked earlier that I could wear out my welcome with questions, but these days I'm self-aware enough to know when to stop bugging people, or at least I hope I am. Larry, the General Motors guy, kind of parachutes in and does his thing and leaves without a lot of BS or time to chat. Rick, as friendly as he's always been, can almost seem a little secretive at times, but that might just be a vibe he gives off after years in NASCAR, where winning and losing is everything and secrets protect championships and endorsements worth millions of dollars. A guy that's long made a living not telling you anything he knows may not be ready to tell you everything he knows the minute he retires. Jim, on the other hand, is always willing to share. Like just last week, he was troubleshooting an old pickup that would fire up but then die immediately after starting with a big belch back out the intake and carb. He did some troubleshooting to rule out the obvious before the end of the day, but ultimately closed up shop for the day without a solution. He awoke in the middle of the night with a start because he suddenly knew the answer. The muffler had rusted, which caused the metal to expand internally and had therefore become restricted. It was good enough for cranking the engine over, but once combustion actually started, the sudden back pressure would overwhelm the intake charge, overpower the piston, reverse the engine's rotation briefly, and hence the backfire. Secure in the knowledge of what it was, he fell back asleep and slept solid till morning, when he confirmed that his theory was in fact correct. As a programmer, that only happened to me once, in about 1994. I was on the COM RPC OLA team, and I'd been working on the OLA presentation cache. That's what does the drawing when, for example, you have a Word document that contains an Excel chart. You don't want to actually load and invoke the Excel program to paint it every time you scroll on by, so OLA actually does it for you, and it supports a number of formats like Bitmap and Metafile. I was brand new and I was assigned a bunch of bugs relating to adding support for Win32's new enhancement of files to the presentation cache. I skimmed a few thousand lines of existing code to get a feel for it and then got to work on a few of the actual bugs. One of them involved elements of the picture being scaled comically small for some reason in certain weird cases. One night at home, I too awoke with a start. I knew where the bug was, and it actually woke me out of a deep sleep. I think I dreamt it and when I saw the bug in the dream, it somehow woke me. I stumbled to my den and I used a variety of ancient tools. First, I used a modem to connect to an ISP. Then I ran Trumpet Windsock or some such nonsense to get an IP address, which I then used to connect to a Telnet server at Microsoft Campus, and then connected a console window that connected to my work machine and so on. There were a lot of hoops to jump through, but A, it was still 1994 and the web wasn't even really a thing yet, and B, getting at the Windows source code with a modem should probably be kind of hard. We're in. Regardless, I got at it and I jumped right to the code that I had dreamed contained the bug. Sure enough, in something to do with screen pixel to high metric conversion, there truly was an error in the math, and it was actually off by a factor of 100. Somehow, I suddenly remembered the code or delay processed it after having skimmed it earlier or some such thing. I wasn't going to change the code in the middle of the night and check it back in. I wasn't quite that confident, so I did what we did in 1994 in a process that would later become verboten. I put a bug bug comment in the code and I went back to bed. I too slept like a baby, secure in the knowledge that I would start the day with an easy fix teed up, ready to go. When I got to work, I veritably sprinted to my desk and brought the code up in slick edit, as was the style of the time. And sure enough, it was indeed a bug, and it was off by a hundred. But if you zoomed out a little bit, you could see that it was also inside IfDef Mac. Sadly, it only affected the Macintosh version of Office, not all of Windows. So it was a bug, but it was not the bug I was looking for. You win some, and you lose some. But what does all this have to do with Gary and asking old guys questions? Well, the thing is I'm older now and I ask a lot more questions than I used to. I am less likely to need to hear myself speak, as it were, than when I were a younger man. And in the case of guys like Rick and Jim, they're happy to chat because they're not really on the clock, but the people at Microsoft most definitely were. So as much as I would have liked to, I never once stopped by Dave Cutler's office just to ask him why we didn't just use Xenix instead of starting fresh with NT. And if I had, it's not like there would have been a bunch of young programmers sitting cross-legged on the floor as he regaled them with stories of his VMS days. 
because we had actual work to do. And it was bad enough if I wasted a few minutes of your time telling you why what you just said or did reminded me of some episode of a cartoon and why that's perhaps ironic or meaningful. Perhaps you'll forgive me then when I tell you about Gary. Gary was an older fellow on our team. How much older? Well, he was literally of my father's generation, actually being two years older than my own dad. Being new to Microsoft, he had an interior windowless office since they were normally given out based on seniority. For all appearances, he might have been a new contractor, and I wasn't quite sure what he did, but it didn't really matter either way since he seemed smart enough and was nice enough, and he was always cheerful, and so Gary was just the guy a couple of doors down from me. He was on the NT print team or the NT display team, and those teams were peers to the NT UI team, which is where I was, and we all reported to the same guy, Leif Peterson. But since we didn't work together on the same stuff, our only real time together would be at lunch and in the break room, where you make the same small talk you would at any company. Along the way, I learned that he had been at Apple at some point in the past, and even at Pixar. He had a great story about them winning an actual Oscar and how he was bummed to find out that he wasn't going to get to accept it on the red carpet, because that's not how they do the technical Oscars. But if you added up all the three-minute private conversations we had, that's about the highlights of what I learned. Otherwise, we went for lunch as a group and so on, but people don't really share personal details in a group situation in the same way. After a reorg or office shuffle, I didn't see him much after a while, then we both retired, and I never saw him again. Then, one day about 20 years later, I was walking by one of my kids who was watching a video on YouTube, Technology Connections or some such thing. And up pops a picture of a guy that I am sure I know, and as you've no doubt guessed, it was Gary. I walked over and asked my son to turn up the volume, and I learned something new. He had been watching an episode on the invention of the laser printer, and it just so happened that Gary was its inventor. It turned out that Gary wasn't just Gary from lunch, he was Gary Starkweather, actual inventor of the one and only laser printer. And it turns out that Gary wasn't just at Pixar when they won an Oscar. In fact, he had done pioneering work on color film scanning for them and for Lucasfilm before them. He must have worked for George Lucas for a long time because it turns out that Gary from the hallway was also a digital effects consultant on the original Star Wars movie in 1977. Yeah, that one. Maybe you've seen it. Gary also won the David Richardson Medal, recognizing his significant contributions to optical engineering back before I'd even dropped out of, let alone gone back to high school, so he was well on his way to a successful career well before he did things like invent color management for the likes of Apple Computer. Because Gary from the break room wasn't just Gary that used to be at Apple. He was an honest-to-goodness Apple fellow, one of the very few. Other little things he'd failed to mention? Oh, like he worked at Xerox Park, which is where he invented the never-mentioned laser printer. But he wasn't just at Xerox Park, he was employee number 23. And it goes on. Had I known any of this, even had I an idea or an inkling, I'd like to think that I would have asked him a lot more questions and hopefully cajoled him into telling me a lot more stories. And it's hard to know. I was a lot younger then. Seeing Gary's photo on YouTube made me nostalgic and curious about him, so I looked him up, only to find out that he passed away about a year ago, at the age of 81, down in Florida. If you bring up all his pictures in Google Images, he's smiling at every single one of them. That's not uncommon for photos, perhaps, but I think it's true to reality in this case, since Gary was pretty much smiling every time that I ever saw him in real life, too. Lasers and optics are cool, and maybe he was responsible for, as I said, the greatest step in democratizing the printing press since Gutenberg, but the main thing I remember about the person is that Gary was irrepressibly cheerful. Either aspect of the person would be fine, but I love it when they're combined like that. Suffice to say, I wouldn't be hearing any news stories from Gary, so I figured the least I could do would be to share one of my favorite old ones that I do know with all of you. As I said, Gary had been a serious guru in the field of lasers and optics. I now know that he'd been granted something like 40 patents in the area of the laser printer, and he was at some big graphics conference or trade show, and he was looking at a fancy new laser printer of some sort that was being introduced to great fanfare as revolutionary. They were showing off the exciting new technology inside, which somehow involved a pentaprism. Gary congratulated them on their discovery, and then noted that he already held a patent on it and had for some time. The guy doing the show about turned white and almost collapsed on the spot. Pretty soon the Xerox brass and a bunch of corporate attorneys were involved. They eventually agreed that the new device likely did transgress on Gary's patent, but the opposing lawyer said that the invention seemed obvious and that anyone could have come up with it. That's when Gary delivered one of my favorite lines. Well, if it was so damned obvious, why didn't you invent it? Turns out he was right, and Xerox made some money off the infringement. I should add that's nothing new, though. After all, the laser printer generated billions of dollars for Xerox and paid for pretty much everything else that Xerox Park ever did, many times over. Fortunately, this story is also one of the ones preserved in an oral history that Gary recorded for the Computer History Museum, and it's available online, as is a written transcript. I could read aloud to you now, but perhaps it's best that I just put a link to it and encourage you to have a look or a listen for yourself. Even if you were to just Google his name, Gary Starkweather, you'd learn some cool stuff. But I'll make it even easier by providing links in the video description, including a couple on how his invention, the laser printer, actually works. If you don't already know, it's pretty clever. 
The moral of the story is pretty obvious, especially if you're young. If you've got access to people like a Jim or a Rick or a Gary, get them talking and just shut up and listen. Don't bother trying to impress them with your own exploits. If they're not the chatty type, go ahead and ask them questions. Most older experts, particularly successful older people, are actually eager to find a worthy young mind with which to share what they've learned. All you need to do is appear genuinely interested and ready to put it to work. Learn everything you can from them because there's some folks, like Larry the Fuel Injection Wizard, where the field is such that not only their legacy but their knowledge kind of lives and dies with them. What they don't share simply because people don't ask could be lost to the ages, so always be sure to ask a lot of questions. By the way, if you enjoyed this particular episode but you're not yet subscribed to my channel, I'd be honored if you took a moment to do so. That'll also let me know that I'm going in the right direction with this episode and I'll make more like it, and if you turn on the bell icon, you'll even be notified of them when I do. It's a win-win. As always, remember I'm not selling anything and I don't have any Patreons. I'm just in this for the subs and likes, so if you did enjoy the episode, please be sure to leave me one of each before going. I'm trying to grow the channel, so if there's somewhere you can share this episode, like an appropriate place to list it on Reddit or for a forum, that sort of thing, please do so. It's kind of a niche interest, but odds are if you were interested, then you probably know somebody else who's interested, so send them a link. And don't forget to head on over to Dave's Garage at 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern, this Sunday, the 24th of January, for my first ever live stream. The more the merrier, so bring a friend. I'm looking forward to your ideas and suggestions. Thanks for joining me here in the shop, and in the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time here in Dave's Garage. This little chair will be waiting for one of you, and a rocking chair for another who likes to rock, and a big armchair for two more to curl up in. All next time on Dave's Garage.